if you missed it, Apple announced yesterday that they were going to be working with Major League Baseball for the 2022 season and they would be introducing a new program called Friday Night Baseball to their Apple TV Plus subscription and hear me out. You might not like Apple TV, you might not even like Apple, but this put the fear of God, of baby Jesus himself into the owners of Major League Baseball because they finally started negotiating in good faith. Apple comes out and says, hey, we are one of the biggest companies in the world. We are one of the most influential companies and we are going to be partnering with you. So don't mess this up. That's kind of the vibe that I got because the owners, they started presenting a good deal and multiple good offers to the Players Association. So much so that I'm gonna knock on wood as I say this, but we might have baseball back today. Okay, I knocked on wood. You can't blame me if it doesn't happen. But anyways, what's going on everyone? It's Fuzzy. Welcome back to yet another MLB recap. I know I was a little bit facetious in the intro, but honestly, it kind of makes sense that the biggest company in the world announcing that they're going to be working with you would kind of speed up the process. And finally, we have some good proposals and offers to talk about, including Fernando Tatis Jr. speaking out against one little bit, kind of the biggest issue. I shouldn't say little bit because right now at this current moment, it is the biggest issue holding back the owners and the players from signing a deal. It is no longer the luxury tax or the CBT, so that is something to note. Now, speaking of the CBT, there is going to be a new rule or a threshold going forward, and it was pretty much because of one single man, Steve Cohen. If you have no idea who Steve Cohen is, he is the current owner of the New York Mets, and he is worth billions and billions of dollars. He loves his team. He loves his city. He loves spending money. So if it was up to Steve Cohen, he would spend $300 million in a single offseason to build a dynasty and a super team. And the other owners are very afraid of him, so they're adding a third subcharge to make rich owners think twice about overspending. This is really only going to affect the Dodgers and the Mets. So I'm going to label this as the Steve Cohen tax or the Steve Cohen threshold because just like Apple, he is putting the fear of God into the owners. And that is pretty much where we're left with in terms of the third subcharge. I don't know if anyone is going to reach this. And Steve Cohen even came out and said that this is good for the greater good of Major League Baseball. So just because we talked about the CBT, let's go ahead and recap the update on that right now. Before, the owners, they were deadlocked at $210 million. They were not going to budget. They set a deadline. Then that deadline got moved, and that deadline got moved, and we kind of showed that the owners aren't actually serious about having a deadline. It's just a negotiating tactic. They could have signed on 210, but the players, they held out rightfully so, and now the owners have presented a deal that caps at $242 million after the next four or five years, and it begins at 230. I'm not sure if the players are fully content with $230 million, but I have to give the owners the benefit of the doubt. Whether they were scared by the Apple or not, they are finally bringing some good faith negotiations to the table and starting at $230 million for a CBT and increasing to 242. Players Association, they wanted to be capped at I think $268 million. So yeah, they're still kind of far apart, but this is excellent news because progress is being made. Now, speaking of progress, there was some made on the pre-arbitration bonus pool front. It's at $40 million, but unlike the CBT, it's gonna be capped on a per season basis. So instead of going from $40 million to 45, all the way up to maybe 65, $70 million, when this new CBA comes to an end, it's gonna be capped at 40 million per season. And I don't know how many players are gonna be involved in the distribution of the pre-arbitration bonus pool. Moving on over to the league minimum, it is gonna be starting at 700,000 and it gets all the way up to 770,000. So what have we discussed so far? Teams are gonna be able to spend a whole lot more money without being penalized. Uh, young players that are pre-arbitration eligible are basically going to be getting bonuses for performing well. There is a brand new $700,000 league minimum that gets up to almost $800,000 so right now, we've pretty much covered all of our bases. And speaking of bases, yes, bigger bases are still a thing. It's not a big deal. Please, for the love of God, stop complaining about it. But there's also an update on the draft lottery. The players were at eight slots and the owners were at five. I think they have come to an agreement that there will be a six-team lottery 
for the draft. So they are going to randomize the top six picks and it will be divvied out that way. I'm cool with that. Now we did talk about young players. Let's go ahead and talk about young players yet again, or even just rookie of the year candidates. If a player finishes first or second in the AL or the NL, they will get a full year of service time. Now I know Wander Franco just signed a fat contract extension, so he might not be the best example. Wander Franco almost finished second in the rookie of the year race, even though he barely played 80 to 90 games. I can't remember the exact amount, but let's say that Wander Franco snuck into the top two, even though he only played 80 to 85 games, he would have been given a full year of service time. And again, it's not really a good example because he already signed that extension, but let's say that he didn't, he would have been able to become arbitration eligible a whole lot sooner, meaning that he gets more money in his pocket sooner. That is a big time W. I don't know how the players are going to react to this, but anytime young players can get an extra year of service time or accrue more service time, that is okay with me. Now, the final little nuance that we have to talk about before we get into the international draft, which is the biggest snag right now, and Fernando Tatis Jr., he's actually calling it out right now, as well as Big Poppy. So before we talk about the international draft, kind of the final thing, teams will get awarded draft picks over time if a player does well after calling them up on opening day. So let's rewind back to Chris Bryant. So the Chicago Cubs, they manipulated his service time. He was not on opening day. If they had just waited 12 to 15 games like they did, they would have gained one extra year of team control from Chris Bryant. And the Blue Jays did the same thing with Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Although they did get lucky because Vladdy got injured. So they used that as an excuse. Hey, we're holding him down because he's injured, even though he should have been up in the big leagues on opening day. So if a Blue Jays or a Cubs, if they would have called up Chris Bryant or Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and they performed well, which Vladdy did, which Chris Bryant did over the next three seasons, both the Cubs and the Blue Jays would have been awarded extra draft picks and anything that derails service time manipulation, anytime that derails players getting taken advantage of, I am all for that. That is kind of a recap of the littler details. And now let's go ahead and break down the biggest snafu right now. Major League Baseball wants to get rid of the qualifying offer, all that really means is, let's say Marcus Simeon, he was given a qualifying offer from the Blue Jays for I think it's 17 and a half, 18 and a half million dollars, something like that. He rejected it. So I'm not entirely sure what getting rid of the qualifying offer will do, but they're tying it to implementing an international draft. So Major League Baseball essentially is trying to stop 12 and 13 year olds from signing with multi-million dollar agencies and getting taken advantage of. They want to be able to have more control of their players that are coming from different markets. Markets. And Juan Soto even said that him not signing at 12 and 13 years old actually benefited him. He was one of the older kids to sign with an agency. He did it about 15 years old. So there are pros and cons to this, including the top pick in an international draft, which would be 20 rounds, would get five and a half million dollars, which is about what the seventh pick in the MLB draft gets, like the normal, regular MLB draft. Randy Arozarena, he signed for 1.25 million dollars back in 2016 as a foreign prospect, but then Luis Garcia signed for 20,000 dollars. If you don't remember, he is on the Astros. Randy and Luis Garcia both finished in the top five in Rookie of the Year voting. Randy got 1.25 million, Luis Garcia got 20,000. So if Luis Garcia had been in the draft, he would have gotten way more than $20,000. But on the flip side, Randy, he was not a super prospect. So maybe he doesn't get that $1.25 million out as a signing bonus. And this is where Fernando Tatis and Big Poppy come into play. Big Poppy, he is a huge voice, maybe the biggest in the Dominican Republic. He says he is not opposed to an international draft, but it needs more time. And breaking news, that time would be given because MLB would not implement this until 2024. So get Big Poppy, Pedro, Fernando, Tatis, get them in the room and see what they say about an international draft. Because Tatis, he came out, he was blunt. He said that this would hurt Dominican baseball as prospects would lose a ton of leverage. My thoughts, yes, he has a point because a lot of people have used Puerto Rico as an example, as a precedent because Major League Baseball implemented Puerto Rico in their own draft. And Puerto Ricans have said that it has kind of hindered the process of becoming a prospect or delays the process of becoming a superstar female Phenom in Puerto Rico. I'm not entirely vested on that subject, so please let me know if you are familiar. Please help me in the comment section down below. But my thought is, 
if we're talking about prospects in America, they don't really have much leverage either. You can't say, yes, I want to go to the Cleveland Guardians or no, I don't want to go to the Kansas City Royals. If you're Adley Rutschman, you have to sign with the Orioles or you don't. But if you don't, you're going to forfeit millions of dollars and you have to wait until the next year. So if you're picked by the Orioles, you're going to play for the Orioles. So if anything, Dominican players and foreign players do have leverage right now because they can choose where they want to go and they can decide, yes, they want to sign for this or no, they don't want to sign for this. If there was an international draft, the leverage and the freedom to do whatever you wanted is taken away. And to be honest with you, I've always thought to myself, the draft is kind of stupid to begin with. The fact that you work your entire life, you, you dedicate your entire existence to being the best of the best. And in some cases, you end up going to a poorly run organization and your career doesn't take off as it should have. I mean, football is the biggest example. And honestly, the most recent example, Matthew Stafford. He was with the Detroit Tigers. He gets shipped off to the Rams and he he wins a Super Bowl in his first year. So honestly, getting drafted is one of the most important things about your career. It sets you up for success or failure depending on if your team is going to sign for agents or make good trades. So that is something to keep in mind. Puerto Rico, again, it was added to the draft and some Puerto Ricans have said that it really did hurt the developmental process of prospects. So let me know in the comment section down below, what do you make of this beefy MLB recap? All of the different things that we talked about with Steve Cohen, he's so rich that owners are afraid of him. Speaking of owners being afraid, Apple announcing that they're working with Major League Baseball is really speeding up the process. And then we have a CB starting at 2.30. We have a $40 million capped pre-arbitration bonus pool, a $700,000 major league minimum that gets up to 770. We have a six-team draft lottery, so those first six picks are randomized. The top two players in the rookie of the year race will get a full year of service time. Teams will be awarded draft picks over time if a player that gets called up on opening day does well over the next three or four years. And then last but not least, an international draft wants to be implemented in exchange for the removal of the qualifying offer. So that does it. I'm crossing my fingers that baseball comes back today. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll hopefully catch you later for another video.